Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We got a great show lined up for you tonight. We're going to kick things off and start by talking about Microsoft Teams. So there were a couple of blog articles and another one in Bleeping Computer that talked about a post-exploitation technique that the Vectra AI project team discovered. And so Vectra published a blog and they said in August of 2022, the project team discovered an attack path that enables malicious actors with file system access to steal credentials from any Microsoft Teams user who is signed in. The attackers don't require elevated permissions to read the files. And additionally, the vulnerability, they said, was determined to impact all commercial GCC desktop teams, clients for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And in their research, they specifically said that Microsoft Teams stores authentication tokens in clear text. And with these tokens, attackers can assume the token holder's identity and then access things through like the Microsoft Teams client, including um, accessing Microsoft Graph API and so on and so forth. Um, and so, uh, you know, from the article, it definitely sounds bad, but at the same time, the account has to be compromised first and you have to have probably access to the device itself. So if they've already gotten to that point, it's really not a vulnerability. It's more of a post exploitation technique. And so in our communications, Adam and I, you know, from our directed communications, um, we're telling our customers that right now we understand where the, exploitation technique lies and that we're probably going to fix it in a uh, a later patch and so it's not like a zero day or anything like that because it requires first access to the device and compromised credentials on top of that not a whole lot to add here um you know if you ever run into something like this and you do want clarity feel free to reach out to your customer success account manager with microsoft they do have access to these um kind of responses that can be given to customers and clarify the situation because I think for a lot of customers that did reach out, they were maybe again, the, the coverage seemed a little, not necessarily sky is falling, but, but maybe didn't really highlight the point that you, you already had to have compromised a user. And so we were able to explain that to customers and kind of talk them off the ledge a little bit. So always happy to do that. We always, um, for, for most of these kind of things that bubble up, do you have those responses available? But again, not great, of course. And and again, will be patched in a future release Microsoft Teams. So um, appreciate the v- Vectra project team responsibly disclosing this, which they did do. So yeah, so- sometimes when we when this like comes out, it's not responsible disclosure. It's somebody trying to make a name for themselves. But in this case, Vectra did. I just want to clarify because I, I get grumpy about this. They did disclose this responsibly, just so we're clear. And sometimes as security professionals, when we see these things come out, we have this knee-jerk reaction like, hey, we need to fix this. We need to be, protect ourselves. And I totally get that. Um, it just kind of reminds me of this conversation that we were having in our uh, chat, Adam and I and, and a bunch of other uh, peers of ours on how someone wanted MFA for their physical servers. And I was thinking like, well, if they're physically located somewhere, you probably already have other mitigation before they even get to the physical server to plug in. And at that point, if you're already getting bypassing your security guard or your locks, or, you know, if you have, iris or retinal scans i mean fingerprints all that to even get to your physical servers which most locations are fairly secure especially like if you're in a colo or something like that then mfa is not really going to do you much they're probably already 
looking at bypassing that, which we're going to talk about in a later show, uh, a little bit actually um, later in this show. So um, anyways, uh, like I said, sometimes we get this knee jerk reaction. And in this case, you know, it is definitely something to be concerned about. But again, you have to have a compromised user account and access to the device for this to happen. Another bit of news that I wanted to just talk through real quick. I saw this floating around on Twitter and LinkedIn. Patreon laid off its entire security team as five employees. And the head of U.S. policy for Patreon also confirmed it, but they didn't like say why, um, other than that they were working with external organizations to develop their security capabilities and conduct re- regular security assessments. It sounded like they were moving to contract this out and this happens a lot with different teams not only security sometimes with it we often talk about contracting out your help desk a lot of companies contract out their sock their initial alerts to sort through all that i think sometimes companies think that they're going to save a lot of money this way but when it comes to security i do think there's a little bit of ownership if you do work for the company and you feel a little bit more invested in its defense whereas if you're a contractor and this is this is kind of like the same argument if you were to use like contract soldiers right like if you're fighting for your country you have a little bit more investment in that versus if you're just getting a paycheck and getting contracted to do something so defense i think is just one of those things where if you f- feel more vested, then m- you might be inclined to do a better job. But I just, that was my thought. I saw it real quick and I was thinking like, hmm, I don't know if this is going to work out for them, but maybe it will. Maybe they think they're going to save some money. You usually have to pay more money for contractors, but you don't have to pay benefits. So I don't know if that equals out or not, but yeah. FTEs do come with a lot of kind of hidden costs that people don't consider. An FTE usually does cost a lot more than just their salary in terms of benefits, 401k match, stuff like that. It does add up. This is interesting, and I can speak to this a little bit from the other side. So I've not worked for like a managed security provider or anything like that. But what I did do was work for IT outsourcing on the other side of it. I was the outsourcing. So my first job out of college was with IBM in Dubuque, Iowa. And what they were building in Dubuque, Iowa was an IT delivery center to deliver IT services, essentially for scenarios where those jobs could not be outsourced to India. So regulated industries. And I can tell you for sure, while I recognize the names of some of my customers and I wanted to do a good job, by no means did I have any investment beyond I need to do a decent job so I keep my job. There wasn't any passion about it. There certainly wasn't any larger desire than that. And I think your comparison, Andy, to Soldiers of Fortune, um, Mercenaries, is apt. You know, I I think of being in a a very dangerous scenario um, with with literally, you know, my life in risk and doing that for money is not a huge motivator for me, but doing it for other things, for passion and pride and patriotism, sure. And, And you can help make your security team feel invested in your company. And on a side note, I can tell you, at least from my corporate IT experience in the past, there wasn't a strong bonus system that was linked to my performance and my objectives, nor was they ever provided equity at any point in any of the companies they worked at before Microsoft. And I can certainly say now that I have been fortunate enough to to receive a little skin in the game, a little ownership of the company it certainly does change the way you think about it and it changes your motivations. In fact, sometimes at Microsoft um, people will like to say, 
I don't get paid on that, or I don't get paid to do that. It's not part of your compensation plan. And I had a former manager that said, are you a shareholder? Then you're compensated on it. You know, will it lead to discuss with the company? You're compensated on it. So um, not only do I not agree with this direction, and I think this is a, a dangerous precedent, but at the same time, I agree with you, Andy, you want people who are not just FTEs, but you want them to have skin in the game. I would encourage anyone who's listening to the show who does manage a security team that you should find ways to, to you know, compensate them for strong performance, but also get them some sort of equity in the company. It doesn't have to be a lot. Even a little equity really, really helps build a sense of ownership. And I think that's something that should extend beyond just senior leaders. You know, it, everyone should have some, some skin in the game in the company. That's a really good idea. And I can say that's, it's been kind of game changing for me. Um, really disappointing to hear this. Now, on the other hand, just to clarify, I do absolutely think there is opportunity to augment your security teams with additional ingenuity outside of your organization. I think that is correct. And that is smart. Things like getting additional threat intelligence or having a second set of eyes reviewing some of your alerts. Those are really, really good things to do. Having somebody else do a, a first pass at really noisy systems or logs or SIMs or whatever. Great idea. But doing this entirely and having nobody on your payroll who's invested in your security. I don't like it, man. So the final thing that we wanted to talk about tonight and where we'll spend the bulk of our conversation is an ongoing security incident. This started happening last night. And so we're going to talk about Uber. If you haven't heard, Uber is having a cybersecurity incident. Last night at 825 Central Time was when I saw it. Ubercom on Twitter tweeted out that they were experiencing a cybersecurity incident. Now, it is still ongoing. A lot of these things are unconfirmed, but from what I've gathered, I'm going to kind of paint a picture of what we assumed happened. There hasn't been a ton of confirmation from Uber side, obviously, because it's still ongoing. But before you go a whole lot farther, I just wanted to add for our listeners, when Andy says last night, he's referring to Thursday, September 15th. We're recording this right now on Friday, September 16th. So... By the time you listen to this, we usually release the podcast late Sunday night, or most people probably get it early Monday morning. This situation could have evolved. So just want to kind of draw that line in the sand. We're speaking with the most recent information available to us as of Friday night, September 16. Thanks for that, Adam. A lot of this information is from Twitter, some initial news feeds, as well as screenshots that were supposedly released on some forums or by the attackers themselves. So from some initial screenshots, it does appear that the attacker spammed an employee with MFA push notifications for roughly an hour. And we assume at this point that the username and password had already been compromised because they're trying to spam them with the MFA response. And so we've talked about this, this MFA spamming um, and a, a very easy way to social engineer people to just push the button so that it goes away. The attacker actually contacted the employee via WhatsApp and said that he was from Uber IT and that the employee must accept the MFA push in order to get it to stop. And so at that point, the employee accepted and the attacker added their own device as an MFA method. So now he has his own MFA. He doesn't need the employees. The attacker then logs into VB VPN and does a rec reconnaissance scan of Uber's intranet. And apparently there was an internal network share that contained a lot of PowerShell scripts. And this is from the uh, an attacker's screenshot where they said one of the PowerShell scripts contained the username and password for an admin user in Thycotic, which is a privileged access management system. And using that, he was able to extract secrets for all services, domain admin, duo, 
one login, AWS, G Suite, et cetera, et cetera. And so there were also screenshots of the identity and access management admin console for AWS. So we assume that that was compromised. We know that their G Drive from G Suite, all the data in there was compromised. There were screenshots from vSphere, their, their VM hosting platform that was also compromised. Slack was also compromised. Their sales metrics, CRM, and their EDR portal. The attackers didn't even notify, or I guess Uber didn't know that they were under attack until the attacker sent a Slack notification to everyone in the company informing them that the company had been breached. And there were a lot of people who even thought it was a joke. And so that was concerning. And then the other thing, you know, having their EDR breached, a lot of EDRs have, you know, quote unquote backdoors in there for administrators, specifically for shell access. For example, in Defender for Endpoint, I wouldn't call, I mean, like you can call it a backdoor. It it is what it is. It's an administrator's way to have shell access to do remediation, which is a very good way to remediate certain things, but you do have that from the administrator console. So you can, if I was a, you know, if my compromise, my account was compromised for a defender for endpoint, then yeah, I would have shell access to every single device that was onboarded. So, um, it's uh, very, very concerning, obviously. With great power comes great responsibility. Thanks. Spider-Man. Uh, whenever we talk about things like a PAM solution, like Thycotic or its brethren, we always point out that they are a tremendously attractive attack target, and you need to be extra vigilant in protecting them. Putting the admin credentials of such an attractive target in plain text in a PowerShell script is not doing that. That is really bad news. And what that shows you is that for all well-intentioned security, it only takes one rogue person, maybe not even intentionally rogue. You know, it's an accident. Didn't think through their actions. Doing something not smart, and the whole thing goes down because of it. I, I mean, that's just incredible. Um, using a solution like that with everything, the keys to the kingdom, literally, like you can't secure that enough. And then Andy, your point about EDR is interesting as well. And um, Andy and I actually got beat up by a customer recently, not really beat up, but just pointed out a difference in EDR solutions that, in Defender for Endpoint, it actually doesn't have a full complement, a full shell access for live response. It has a limited set of capabilities there. And I would imagine this is by design where being able to drop a full-on shell on every single endpoint in an organization is pretty attractive attack surface. And so if there are some common sense ways we can limit that, maybe that's a good idea. But other vendors apparently don't do this. And so their EDR solutions do allow just literally a full unfettered command prompt. Do whatever you want, man. It's all good. So between those two things, access to all the admin credentials in the whole org, shell access to every endpoint in the whole org, we think as security folks, we have it all figured out and we get these incredibly powerful tools and they can be used for evil very, very easily. And so that's something we need to think about. Maybe sometimes it's better we don't have the tools so nobody else can have the tools either. It's better when something doesn't exist in our environment because at least then there isn't the risk of it falling into the hands of a bad guy as well. And so I think that's something more security teams should look at because we get hung up on having all this access and all this convenience and being able to do anything anywhere at any time. And in all honesty, maybe if we withhold that power from ourselves, we do protect our work better in some ways. It's, it's something worth thinking about. I'm not saying like PAM solutions are universally bad or EDR solutions are universally bad. I'm just saying 
like I led with, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, so some thoughts on mitigations, right? I looked through a lot of the tweets from all the people that I follow and kind of aggregated a bunch of their thoughts. But one of the things that was initial, I think, gut reaction to it was Adam and I talked about this a few weeks ago on one of our shows, which is the authenticator matching with the numbers. I think we talked about it when it came to this MFA push fishing episode where, you know, if you have numbers that you have to match or enter in or geographical location, that's just a little bit of information there for your user to kind of figure out um, just to, trigger hopefully something in them if they're seeing it come from out of the country maybe they'll think that that is suspicious or um, if they can't read off the numbers for the specific mfa Um, so a lot of the chatter was about turning on number matching and so if you are a microsoft customer let's say you're just using o365 couple of things that you can do in O365 MFA. First, if you go in there, there's an option for app passwords. I would recommend turning this off. App passwords are not necessarily very safe anymore. They're an old way of authenticating, and it's something that you should probably turn off unless it's absolutely critical for your organization, which I can't imagine it is. So I would disable that. I'd also disable call to phone and text messages. Like those should be disabled unless there's a specific reason, business reason that you have for that. And you could try to limit it to a certain small group of people. There's also a section for valid IP addresses. And I kind of harp on this all the time because a lot of organizations will say, if you're coming from these IP addresses, go ahead and disable MFA because we don't want to bother our users. We don't want to keep prompting them for MFA every time. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is some truth to that. You don't want to get that MFA fatigue, but if you're disabling your network from ever getting MFA prompt, I mean, you're literally disabling the one thing that you have that can stand against a lot of different attacks. So I would recommend turning this off if you're still an O365 customer. Now, if you're an Azure AD with conditional access, you can then do certain things to help mitigate that MFA fatigue. First off, you should go in and turn on passwordless. This is pretty simple to do. Go to authentication methods and find the policy for Microsoft Authenticator. Enable the uh, authenticator for either all your users or a selected number of users. And then turn the configuration to either any or passwordless. So um, if you change it to um, yeah, so you you want to you want to choose any or passwordless. If you change it to push, it will prevent the use of the passwordless phone sign in credential. So make sure it's on any or passwordless. And in order to take advantage of the password list. This is an extra step. Actually, I th- we were talking, I don't know if it was you and me, Adam, but I-, I was talking with one of the customers and they were unsure how to actually turn it on because there's an admin side to it. And then if you truly want that password list experience, the user has to enable phone sign in on their authenticator. So there's an additional step for that user to enable that mm-hmm. in order to truly get the password list experience. Also, If you have preview features enabled, you're going to see this new configuration tab with three different options now. There's going to be require number matching for push notifications, show the application name in the push or password list notification, and then show geographic location in the push or password list notification. Again, you can enable this for all your users. You can enable it for some if you want to do some testing first, but highly recommend that you turn these options on if you're an Azure AD customer and you have conditional access. Um, Same thing goes for if you're using a different IDP, right? There's a lot of options out there. um, And if you're using a different IDP, 
contact them and see if there's a way to do this type of number matching or geographic location context or anything like that, passwordless authentication, um, and see if you can configure that in your solution. I think some good call outs here for sure. And yes, we did talk about the number matching a little bit when we talked about the MFA spamming, MFA bombing, whatever you call it thing to help mitigate some of that. So if you think in the context of this Uber scenario, the attacker was able to social engineer the person they were attacking by saying, if you would just accept this, it would stop. And I suppose there's a way to word that and make it sound official ish coming from it that, You'd trick somebody into doing that. Sure. I think it would be much harder to convince them of that same thing. If you wanted them to send the number back to you, tell me what number just popped up on your phone. This is it. I mean, it's possible. Cause again, people like social engineer SMS text messages that get sent to you with like a code. So it's doable, but there is that extra step that might make somebody say, huh, that's weird. Or Andy, you talked about turning on some of these preview features like the geographic location. That might be enough context as well, where it pops up and says, here's your number. It's 39 or whatever. And by the way, this, this request is coming from St. Petersburg. That again, might make somebody think twice. So those are all helpful things for sure. In just getting that user to take that, take that beat and think about what they're doing before they do it. So very helpful. Also agree as much as possible, turn off the plain old telephone system methods like voice phone call and SMS text message. This has kind of been beaten to death at this point. Um, if you can turn this off, please do. If you can't, that's cool too. Um, while SIM swapping is a thing and is a risk, it has gotten better. It's relatively difficult to do today. The carriers do demand a lot before they will swap out a SIM. I remember I tried to do this at a T-Mobile store, I don't know, relatively recently, and I was shocked and pleased at the amount of rigor involved with completing that process, as well it should be. So I think the carriers have gotten better, but it does give you a dependency on the security of that on another organization and their security policies. So there is still risk inherent there. And while the big three may have stepped up their security game, of course, you're probably going to have users that are going to be with the regional carrier, like a us cellular or a C spire, um, or even some of these like MVNOs that are very low cost and they might have even less security to swap a SIM. So something worth thinking about as well. Other than that, I think everything else, Andy, your recommendations are spot on and, and really good to, to help lock some of this down and, and bring some security to the situation. And again, it's, it's all cat and mouse game, right? I mean, attackers are going to adapt to new methods and then we're going to try to bring in new mitigations to those and they'll figure new things out. That's why we're in this business because it changes every day and we always have to be on our toes. And we mentioned that there were some internal PowerShell scripts that, you know, had plain text passwords in them. Number one, you assume that even internal scripts might get compromised at some point. So you want to practice good security hygiene there. PowerShell also does try to help DevOps protect secrets, like through get credential, PS credential, secure string. They include warnings when you're doing it wrong. So if you put in something PowerShell will actually pop up a warning and say, hey, like this is not secure. You should do it this way. So mm-hmm. a little education or just kind of, you know, making sure that your developers are in the loop and working with the security shop and hopefully partnering with them. If you don't have an AppSec program, you don't have to necessarily know everything about application development, but at least you can help guide them with the right way. Like, Hey, should we put this credential in here like this? No, you should, you know, convert it to a secure string hash it, whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. So finally, the last thing was fish resistant MFA, which we've talked about before. It kind of came into 
more mainstream when the federal government recommended that every you know civilian agency go to fish resistant MFA. Twilio was also a company that was compromised in August of this year with a similar tactic using SMS phishing. And so when you're talking about these social engineering or MFA bypasses, a lot of this has to do with like the proxy that we talked about, evil jinx. Mm -hmm. And for Twilio, that was basically what happened was an SMS phishing attack that redirected to a proxy, which then looked, well, it was the exact login page. Users then entered in their credentials. And there's even now a phishing as a service called evil proxy, which basically makes it trivial for any person to create a phishing campaign. All of this to say really like you can move to fish resistant MFA being like a FIDO2 method and it will mitigate this because there's nothing to fish anymore. I can't provide you that MFA push because you have to have that physical device in order to do that. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why like log4j wasn't as bad as it was, was because every specific instance that needed to be compromised had to be tailored to that exploit in order to make it work. But when you make it trivial, like this evil proxy phishing as a service where they have a graphical UI, I can do drop down menus and select, I want to fish, you know, Mr. Adam Brewer at Microsoft. Um, I want to send it for a month and I'm going to add this to my cart and I'm good to go provide a credit card. And here we go. You know, like that makes it trivial for anyone to create a phishing campaign using something like an evil jinx, which is not trivial to do if you don't know how to use evil jinx. But in this case, I'm just buying it as a service. And so once it's been commercialized like that, it really becomes a a much greater threat. And so look at FIDO2, especially for your critical accounts. If you're using Windows computers, you can use Windows Hello for Business, and then that will satisfy the MFA requirement if you have that as a condition in order to access your company resources. That way, users aren't getting prompted. You know, we talked about in the beginning where users are getting that MFA fatigue. Well, if you're using Windows Hello for Business and you have conditional access for MFA, you don't get prompted. I know exactly when I'm going to get prompted on my corporate device for which sites that require MFA. I mean, everything pretty much requires MFA, but there are specific sites I go to that I know, hey, I'm going to have to have my phone nearby because it's actually going to give me an MFA prompt. One of them is our HR system. Every time I log into my HR system, it requires an MFA prompt on the phone. It doesn't save that session. It doesn't, it forces the MFA prompt. So that way, when I go there, I know, right? But everything else, if I were to get prompted for MFA, that would be a red flag right away. I'd be like, hmm, that's weird. I, I normally don't get prompted for MFA going to this site. Yeah. So that's, you know, one way that you can, again, help your users out um, and also have that, you know, fish resistant. Windows Hello for Business is considered fish resistant, so... There is a security overview presentation that I've delivered a number of times over the years. And one of the things it talked about, I'd say fairly presciently, was the rise of, what did we call it, phishing as a service or compromise as a service becoming available to where you can pay someone money and they will go hack someone for you essentially. And these aren't just like fly by night operations. They come with an SLA. They come with 24 by seven customer service. You know, they come with guarantees. They come with all sorts of things today. They're very service oriented. This isn't just hand a guy a bag of Bitcoin in a dark alley on the internet and they give you something and go away. There's an ongoing relationship here. And when you start to commoditize some of these attacks, like these proxy attacks that can 
steal credentials and MFA tokens and everything else. It, it is another step in that cat and mouse game where attackers got really good at breaking into organizations that didn't have multi-factor authentication. Well, now MFA has become relatively widespread and they're coming up with ways to compromise that as well. That's to be expected. Nobody ever said MFA was a silver bullet. MFA, to be crystal clear, MFA is a mitigation against the weakness in passwords until we get rid of passwords. That's what MFA is. Just so we're really clear, because I think a lot of people had this perception that it was this unbreakable thing and it was never presented as that. And Andy, I think your other point is really spot on as well. MFA fatigue is a solved problem. If your IAM vendor is delivering an experience that gives MFA fatigue, then maybe you need to look at a different vendor because this, this is a solved problem. I, and, and everyone at our company can attest to this or anyone with a well-configured Azure Active Directory installation can attest to this. You should not see prompts to get out your phone and do something all of the time in your day-to-day -day work. Like Andy said, I would, I would say the same thing. I know exactly what sites and when I get prompted. Otherwise, my day-to-day -day work I can conduct without ever needing to pull out my phone and do my authenticator app. And I know when I do and when I don't, it's predictable. And um, that's because I'm actually always doing multi-factor authentication. There's always a second factor involved. Everything requires it all of the time, but it requires it in a way that might not be seen to me. So if I'm signing into my Windows PC, my second factor is that I did Windows Low for Business, which combines something I know and something I have, or something I am and something I have. Or if I'm signing in on my Mac, it might be the fact that I signed into my Mac and my Mac is a trusted device, you know, as an example. So either way, it's just one of those things that it, it's really a solved problem. So you can really help make it so that when users do get MFA prompts, they actually seem anomalous and might again, get users to second guess what they're doing, which is the goal. We want to get users to a point when they can themselves detect when something is, is not right. And the way you do that is by making those things rare. I mean, not only do I not get prompted for MFA a lot, I definitely get prompted for my password even less. I'm not sure I know what my corporate password is at this point. So that's a good thing. And again, love the call out. FIDO2, Windows Slow for Business, they are fish-resistant methods. You should deploy them. I especially love FIDO2 for privileged accounts. It's just a no-brainer. Use FIDO2 with your privileged accounts, and then there's no risk of phishing. It's practically um, not fish impossible, but it's definitely fish resistance. So it's a, it's a good place to be. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or future topics you want us to talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.